Oh, look who's here today. Dan Spitz. What's going on, on Dan? bro? <laughs> I've been trying to have you on for, I don't know, maybe a good six years or something. Yeah, I'm uh, I kind of shy away from normal uh, heavy metal type interviews. So uh, yeah. if it has to do with watchmaking, I'm like all in. So once you said press go on watchmaking, I press go. Oh, yeah, man. I am a watch fanatic, and I always uh, uh, like to ask people what got them into it. Because for me, it was James Bond in the 70s. He had that Submariner, you know, that, and that was it. I was like, I, I got to get a I got to get a Rolex Submariner like Bond, <laughs> you know, he was yeah. the first kind of dude that had the the Submariner. Yeah, and, and like using a, a famous person as a, a push for a brand kind of thing, it really opened opened the, all the other brands' eyes to like, you know, using famous people to push a product, which wasn't like a big thing back then, you know? Rolexes back then, they're just, they're just your everyday, better than average tool watches that were nice and waterproof and you could beat the shit out of them, you know? It was the first watch you really could beat the shit out of, basically. Yeah, I, mean, I, got, I got one over here right now from from this mid '60s here from a local collector that needs a full uh, full restoration. So they're still going, and that's what's cool about them. Well, I think that's the amazing thing is, you know, you get into it, and either you understand like, you know, oh, Rolex is really the entry level into watches. Or, or you're one of those people who are like, fuck that. I wear a G-Shock. That's bullshit, you know? <laughs> but it really will, uh, you know, will grab people. And then you get fascinated with, you know, you go from Rolex to Paddock to AP. And then you just keep going up and up and up into these crazy guys, even like yourself, that makes like four watches a year or something. And, um, and, and that whole science of that, you know? Yeah, that's when when people um, wanted wanted to know like where did I go after I played music, you know? And I saw stuff like in the beginning, like hey, the dude's like fixing cuckoo clocks or some shit, you know? It's like it, that pretty much puts it all into perspective of there's usually like no middle ground. There's the guys who think I you know repair cuckoo clocks, and then there's the guys that are so deep in the rabbit hole that you know they're the guys that are bringing me their stuff. So there is a, a middle ground, you know, and it really should be, people should be aware exactly what you just said that, you know, back then before there was G-Shocks, you know, the Rolex was the tool watch to go out and, uh, you know, you got a little bit of money. It wasn't like the luxury goods. I mean, the guys were buying them in the, in the army stores who, who were in the army, they were for sale there. So really, if you think about that, how that correlates to nowadays, that's the brand they were back then. It's like if the if the guy in the army's like, you know, my bull of a man, I trashed that shit to death. Like I need something just a little bit better that'll last longer. I was like, okay, I guess I'll splurge and just go down to the canteen store here and get myself a Rolex while I'm, you know, uh, while I'm going going out to to shoot somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's that famous video that's been going around the last couple of years where the uh, ex-Vietnam vets got the date or the GMT, you know, with the box and everything. And he's at that roadside show thing. And, and he goes, well, this watch is worth like, you know, 75,000. But since you have everything, it's worth a hundred and fit. And the guy falls on the ground. Yeah. Those are the type of dudes that, um, which is really interesting, would go into the canteen and they go, uh, what do you got? And they go, well, we got like one Rolex, we got a GMT, and then we got like a, a Daytona thing over here or a Tornick Ravel, you know? Right. And you just yeah. grab something. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're, they they were, you know, you had to still save up, you know, maybe, you know, a, a good maybe month's salary, but it's not, it doesn't correlate to what what it is now as far as what they, what they get for it. But people who want to understand, you know, where, where and what I do a little bit, uh, you know, they should, I like to correlate watches to, to cars because most people can understand that. Whereas, you know, a, a Rolex is more like a, it's a Cadillac, you know, it's an old Cadillac, you know, like it, 
big thing, you know, 69 or 71, you know, Coupe de Ville, you know, it, it's a battleship, man. It, it, it just keeps going. It's just a normal, basic thing. It's built very, very well inside the mechanics because that's what concerns me. I'm a watchmaker. I'm, I'm a micro mechanic. And then, like you said, it starts getting nuts, bro. And that's what entertained me when I was young, growing up in my grandfather's store. I'm a third generation. Uh, you know, he opened up, uh, put me on his lap and opened up the back of a paddock Philippe. My grandfather was a watchmaker and a jeweler. And I looked inside and I, I was like, like a little kid would be, you know, like mesmerized because uh, I was always building stuff, other stuff in my, in, growing up. My room looked like kind of like, like a small NASA, <laughs> you know? And so I was always fixing stuff. But once I saw that, I was like, wow, you know, like I was hooked. So once I was done with music, I, I really deep dove into where I ended up today, which is pure working on pure insanity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the second uh, introduction to me uh, of Rolex was from the incredible scene in The Deer Hunter, which is one of the greatest films ever made, where they whip off the GMTs, you know, and they're they're gambling with the Russian roulette, like, ganga, ganga, you know? And then you're like, I mean, I think really between military and spies was how I, I really got into it. But it's interesting to hear that you're third generation. I had no idea because I definitely wanted to know what got you into watches because when you and I were growing up in the heavy metal world, you didn't give a fuck what time it was. You know, I didn't wear a watch for years and I would clown bands that wore watches on stage. I'd be like, ah, watch rock, you know? Yeah. And then, not up until I would say in the last 10 years of uh, hip hop videos and Instagram does AP and Paddock even come in. And then we get into like Grubel Forcey and, and, and these guys that are another crazy level, but it's quite interesting to see the super watch nerds like yourself or me, or say a John Mayer and guys like that compared to people that are just wearing them for fashion. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I went, I went deep down, you know, to, to the rabbit hole. Actually, when I was playing music, um, there are other people that were into watches. I remember I, I had a Cartier, uh, uh, it was a Panther mechanical and I ran into Joe Perry backstage at a Metallica show. Well, I guess it was Anthrax Metallica. I can't remember. Um, and I keep the same watch on. He, he, he came up to me. He's like, dude, same watch, you know? And I was like, cool. Like, my hero. Like I didn't even know what, I couldn't even talk, you know, that, that Joe Perry is my, you know, he's, he is, you know, my hero, you know? Uh, so it was like, we just sat down and we just started talking watches. So it was happening back then, but it was quite different than it is now. Now it's really escalated because of like me and my friends who are independent watchmakers, meaning we manufacture timepieces that um, are above normal brands. Like any other industry, you have the brands and then you have independent people who break out who want to do crazier shit and we all uh as a population now we don't need to really tell the time on a timepiece on a wrist anymore right my generation my parents generation when you left the house on your, on your fucking bicycle you needed to be home at 5 30 you get your ass kicked you better have a little watch on you had a watch when you were a little kid six eight years old you, you know you, you got a mickey mouse watch you got a watch that's how you got home right we don't need any of that now. We have the time on our phone. We have the time all around us, wherever we go. Uh, so it's changed the perception of the watchmaker uh, who creates and, and mechanisms from scratch and, and makes them into making micro mechanical arts. Now we can take what we as watchmakers only saw before when we, we would pop the back off a watch. It wasn't see-through back then. We didn't have display backs back then, right? Uh, even Patek Philippe, or Vacheron, Constantine's, Audemars Piguet's, they were all closed in the back, um, especially 50s and 60s watches because they weren't waterproof, they were dustproof. So only the watchmaker got to see the beautiful balance wheel going back and forth and all the, the, the anglage and the perlage and the decorations that were done by hand, fully by hand back then. Only us would see that. Um, but now we don't need to have time uh, really displayed in a, in a quick fashion where we just go, oh, I know what time it is quickly. We can take what was normally on the back and move all those mechanics to the front 
because it's more exciting and we can see the mechanics. And what that does is it's just like thrash metal. It, it, it we, The indie guys are the thrash metal of watchmaking, whereas it's now like, all right, bro, show me what the fuck you can do. What's your complication? What can you do? What can you, what kind of micro mechanics can you resurrect from the past that perhaps that guy died before it actually became like a, 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 a viable way and a mechanism that actually worked. It usually takes the second watchmaker or the third genius to figure out what that guy did wrong. It's so complicated and so small. So we're able to do that and show that it's turned into more like micro mechanical art at the indie level. And you got your, you know, your and all, they're all my friends. You know, we all went to school together. So it's now what, when you decide, when you leave Anthrax, do you head straight to like uh, a watchmaking school, like in Switzerland or what? I've had guys on that have went to like the schools at AP and, and stuff like that out in Switzerland, you know? Right. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Next week, I enrolled in a, you know, can't just enroll, first of all. Um, you, you have to do like a self, a two, week, two to three week self aptitude tests to see if you're even viable uh, in your humanness. <laughs> that you can you can deal with what's ahead because the dropout rate uh, along the years in school is is extensive. So I I enrolled in at that time we had a four year uh, school here uh, the Bulova School of Watchmaking. So I immediately enrolled enrolled there out in uh, in Queens and I was driving from Rockland County to Queens and back every day. Uh, I just wanted not just a diploma. Um, but I always wanted to work on the world's most complicated timepieces. I mean, the mechanics uh, that are just like, there's very few people that, that can you know, go for it, you know, because it's just as challenging as playing thrash metal music. You know, thrash metal music is, it's so intricate and so fast, but so precise that e even within our band, my past band, if you made the slightest little mistake live on stage, you know, we each would ream each other out. Like, it's not like you could be drunk and sloppy playing, you know, pussy music and just, you know, la la strummy music. It's precision, which war, as we always say, it's war. You know, we hit the stage, it's, it's war within ourselves as a band and war against the other bands. We're all friendly backstage with the other bands, but that's where that whole kind of, it's war kind of thing comes from, you know? Like, yeah. we, we all hang out and you, you know, obviously I grew up, you know, together in a van with Metallica. So <laughs> we all were friends, but when it hits the stage, it's like, look out, dude, like who's going to blow each other off the stage. And that, that correlates to, to, to the whole watchmaking trip too. So you, you take your aptitude test and I, I, uh, I stayed in that school, but I ended up being the fastest graduate in the history of the school. Wow. Um, I was like doing chronographs like within, before the second year. So they were already like calling the only school in Switzerland saying like, kind of like we got this freak, freak, freakazoid here. And it's only because I, I've been fixing stuff in my room. Like I told you my whole life, I'm, yeah. I'm, good, I'm good at problem solving other shit that people can't fix kind of thing. So I ended up uh, doing apprenticeships for numerous years. Cause um, uh, there's a school in Switzerland. It's the only English speaking school there called Wostep. Uh, and, and at that time, that was the only school you could learn anything above a Rolex in that spoke English. Uh, so uh, I finally got accepted to that school. It's a scholarship. It's paid for by the Swiss government and and, brand, and the big brands that, that fund it to try to find uh, six people every three years. One is chosen from each country to train them for complications. So you usually have to have 15 years of experience in a four year to minimum school before you went there at that time. So at that time it was me, Carrie Vutalainen, uh, the Gronenfeld brothers, uh, Sarpaneva. If anyone knows any of these names, that means you know in indie watchmaking. We were all within a year or so, um, or uh, my friend Henrik, who now runs a Swiss watchmaking school. Um, so at that time, the gentleman who, who created the course of Wostep to teach watchmaking and opened the school. His name was Antoine Simonin. He was the president of the Swiss Watch Federation. And his dream was to implement his course all over the world, have a couple schools in America, a couple schools here to train and lift up uh, watchmaking its level. So we could do the chronographs and 
perpetual calendars outside of Switzerland. To that point, if you had a perpetual calendar, it went back to Switzerland. There's just no confidence, especially in our country. And we, we're just like watch fixers here. You know, they don't, right. they, they, don't they view us as hacks. The, they don't even send, they won't even send parts over here for anything like above a chronograph because we're just we're just American hacks. We're not trained correctly. So anyway, I, I, I did that school and then I did a complications courses there and then I went on to work you know, under NDAs for many companies. Uh, being a ghost builder, it's like a ghost songwriter. Right. That's, that's what all the indie guys are. If everyone wants to know, I, I speak about this a lot. And I correlate it to music so people understand that in music, there's ghost writers for all the pop stars. You think they're writing their own songs and they're just a face, you know, right? We all know that they don't write their music, right? They're hiring ghost writers who have a track record of writing hits. They watch making, it's the same thing once you get uh, those Swiss credentials and people know who you are. Uh, and each one of us are good at a certain part, developing a certain part of a watch or testing for longevity or whatever it may be, whatever our, our expertise is in, the, in that corner of uh, micromechanics. So we all work on the NDAs. If a big brand, I won't name a name, wants to make five of a certain kind of crazy watch, uh, you have to think of it as they're massive companies. They're not three old guys in a hut on top of a fucking snowy mountain like they want you to perceive it to be, right? When you roll in for the first time over there and see it, you're like, holy shit, this is like bigger than Ford Motor Companies and this ain't even a big brand. Wow. You know? Yeah, no, it's massive, dude. Massive. Wow. Massive. So we, we um, they hire us, basically. Outsourcing. We have our own workshops and one guy was specialized in making just the pinions. You know, they're, they're the steel gears that are inside the brass gears. Another guy is good at making the brass gears. Another guy is Good, he's a main plate maker, you know, and the team comes together uh, outside of their atelier. And then we're, we're the ghost builders for those certain parts. And then the team gets together and those special watches are built, but you never know who built them in the past before the interweb. You get it? Like no one knew that you, you bought that name brand, which would go unnamed, could be any name brand. And you were wearing and thought that they built that in their factory they couldn't, they would have to stop their assembly line for all their other pieces to, to make five of a certain kind of crazy watch. It doesn't make monetary sense, right? There's still team leaders and all that. But once the internet was born and all us indie guys that some of them I mentioned coming through that special school I went to, Wolstep, uh, were able to have direct contact to uh, the collectors, we can now sell direct. So we basically split from working for those companies. And over the years, we acquired all of this uh, antique equipment uh, that they had placed in the basement of these massive factories because they were bringing in CNC to make things uh, in, in, in more mass quantities. And uh, it was too slow to you know, use these old machines that made all the greatest watches in the world from the from, excuse me, from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. They're the greatest watches in the world. All those machines were rusting in the basements and warehouses all through Switzerland and Germany of all these places. And we started, like, we worked there. So we would see them and we knew we were getting ready to, to like, split. We were like, dude, like, would you sell me that, like, ah, Sierra F1 milling machine? You know, it's like the world's most accurate milling machine in the world. That's the machine that was making those parts in the 40s for chronograph or whatever it was. I'm like, yeah, sure, you know, and we would find another one and another one, and through two or three of them, you could build one good one, and that's how independent, you know, watchmaking was born because the machines are too expensive for mortals to purchase. There, uh, a Shaolin lathe could be, you know, just the lathe could be, you know, one hundred fifty thousand dollars for just for a little lathe. So, it's priced for big industry. That's you know, crazy. It's right off of them. So. So if we can get an old rusty one for 10 grand, you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and then three years later, you save up and, and you get another piece of equipment and three, and you're working at the company, right? So after 10, 15, 18 years of all of us, and that's the story you guys always read as collectors, you know, uh, how this guy, you know, broke out because he, that's what you do. And then you're off time, you're fixing it and re restoring it, trying to find the missing parts out there, you know, and, and you just build up your arsenal until you're like, okay, 
I'm ready to cut the tie. You know, I'm going to make my own watch and I can sell it direct now. You know, you can sell direct. And that's how Indy was born. It's a lot like uh, guitar building. You know, you got to think about Fender in the 50s and Gibson. They're making them by hand. And then the CNC machine comes in. And mm-hmm. then next thing you know, they're just cutting bodies and there's no heart and soul in them anymore. Right. And uh, until the kind of quote unquote master built uh, came around and then that got hot again, but it is a lot like that. Or even the automobile world, you know, of, of Ford and, and Chevy and all that just robots and, and Porsche to an extent uh, building these cars and doing the welding and everything. It's wild. Yeah. Very, very similar. It's, it's, it's really weird to see that in those industries that you just named, we're still hooked on, you know, what's the word vintage now, right? When I grew up, it was just old shit. <laughs> you know, the 69 Camaro. I mean, I had a 69 Camaro growing up. It was like this fucking thing. It, it can't even handle going around the turn. Now it's like, you know, it, it's vintage, right? Um, but it's not that it's just vintage. It's when I open up older, older time pieces, uh, Vashon Constantine or, or something that's, that's just like built. You just you just kind of open it up and you're like like because if you do modern main brand watches we can say Rolex I guess you know along those lines it it, it really is um, it, it, it's not just the CNC machine that's doing this it's engineered to last a certain amount of time just like they do to your car at a hundred thousand miles you know at 105 your tranny is fucking about to go that shit is designed to go at 103,200 miles you know they test it it's not like by half a chance that every car only lasts 100,000 miles so it's the same thing in that industry so if they can make the, the the gears just a little skinnier that's less beryllium bronze they have to use because they're not making eight watches or four or two like some of my friends make they're making them by the thousands you know, or if you're Rolex, it's a million watches a year. That's two and a half thousand watches a day. Wow. Okay. That's Rolex. They're the biggest in the fight, you know? Um, So the parts, yes, the watch is balanced. It goes together beautifully when I build it or rebuild it, but everything is made skinnier. Um, um, when When I open an older watch, even if the parts, there is no more parts for them, right? So I, I can manufacture, I'm, I'm rare in America where I can manufacture just about any gear, pinion, anything within my four walls, right? I can build just anything. And uh, of the older watches, because the wheels are thick and built like an old fucking Camaro, it's a simple engine, you open the hood. I mean, even your dad can take that engine apart. He didn't even have to know much, right? He could somewhat figure it out, there's not much to it, there's no electronics. Same kind of thing in our watches. And that's why the vintage watches have just surged everywhere. Everybody wants them. When I open a new watch, you know, in 45 years, I can't make those parts here. Nobody can. Nobody will be able to. So it's disposable. At, even at that high, high level, the parts are too uh, skinny and small. Uh, even for me to manufacture, I have CNC here even for me to manufacture any other way. I can't go on my lathe and cut wheels and gears the old way. You know, like the, you can't, you can't just keep these watches going for 800 years. The vintage ones I can. I, you know, I think something that's really interesting in the guitar world and the watch world in any kind of indie companies is the early guys say a uh, Leo Fender or Gerald Genta. Um, yeah. They nailed something that I think that is just as important uh, as build quality is design. I think design is the number one thing that knocks me out when it comes to a Vacheron 222 or uh, an AP 5402 or a Submariner or, or the Daytona. The design was so fucking hit out of the ballpark. It reminds me a lot of Gibson and Fender. When it comes to people making indie guitars, it's the headstock that really I'm always like, eh, the headstock's just not (laughs) happening. You know what I mean? And a lot of indie watchmakers, I look at and go like, 
Yeah, I know it's fucking better. I know it's better than the Rolex, but the design is not there, you know? Yeah. And there seems to be about four designs for watches. Chronos, Diver, uh, you know, the the date just type of dress watch, you know, that kind of stuff, you know? So it's it's got to be really interesting because you could be a man who is a master at at building and fixing but you might not have a design flavor, you know? Right. right. Well, it, it, I totally agree with you. Um, we There's only so many um, calibers, movements, that were available for so long, bro. So it, a, a chronograph was built and designed one way, you know, back in, in, the, in, the, in the late 1920s, early 30s, uh, a two-edge two chronograph. So, you, you know, your counters were positioned a certain way. You can't just go, oh, dude, man, let's just, for design sake, let's just put the 30-minute the counter at 1 o'clock and then, and then and oh, we got a 12-hour counter now, you know, down. You can't just do that. It's micro-mechanics. And if one little thing is moved two microns the wrong way, then the whole thing is, is screwed. You know, you, you can't just move stuff around. And we deal in microns. That's, that's what watchmaking is. So for so long, it was, that was it. Like just, just back then to make a chronograph was, you know, crazy, right? We, they didn't have CAD. I mean, the dudes, like their architects drawing on a piece of paper back then, you know, they just geniuses, absolute geniuses. And most of the stuff was done. Almost everything was invented by Breguet before there was a fucking light bulb, <laughs> you know? I mean, there aren't a lathe. there's no motors for our lathes. I yeah. mean, I, I, I get stuff on my bench from, you know, from the 16 or 1700 sometimes. And you just look at it and you're just like, Jesus, like, that's what I think about. Like, this dude was like, it's like he, he was almost like whittling wood outside to make a fire to get heat with no light. or no, And like, how the fuck did he make this thing? You know, it's like, that's what, that's the kind of stuff that trips me out. Because we go inside. It's not just the style. So the mechanics, is, the mechanics is what gets us hard, if you know what I mean. Oh, so, man. I mean, yeah. you know, it's interesting that you said that there's these ghost builders because in my mind, when I'm I'm at a big watch event and a guy wh whips out a perpetual calendar, there's that big myth of there's one dude and he's in a room, yeah. you know, and he's yeah. building this thing and it takes 12 months. And, and that's always been in my fucking mind. So to think that there's one guy that's building the dials, another guy's building the gear. That's wild to know. Yeah. Well, brands, you know, it, there's a lot of that going, going on. It, it, you can't, it's impossible to do that. At, once you start selling that many watches, they want that you to perceive that notion that it is what it is. Um, that is what indie watchmaking is now. Okay. Um, usually a guy is making, you know, maybe three a year or up to maybe like a carry boot to lane who makes 50 or a Krivia, those kind of guys. So that's that, that's, that's what indie is, but the bigger brands, they, they can't even, you know, I, mean, I went to a dial factory, you know, you, you take all these trips when you're in the wool step school, uh, because you're privy to, uh, what others are not allowed to see, uh, Including, I remember being in, in the swatch rooms in the swatch factories, uh, and we walked in just for swatch. It's not even like high end, but we walk in and we're like, "What the fuck, dude? There's no windows anywhere." Like, and when I say factory, I'm talking like it's the the one line was probably a quarter of a mile long that was producing timepieces. What? And I'm we're like, "What?" He goes, "Yeah, we closed up all the windows because we caught the Chinese." up on the mountains far far away with those big long lenses trying to spy on our secrets of how we're producing the you know the watch by robots because nobody it, it's it's almost like what elon musk wants to do put the metal in one end and then the watch comes out the other and there's no human interaction it's just done that's what they were doing wow we got to see that but we got to see that at every brand uh so that's what we were privy to and that's when you go to a dial factory and you walk in and you're like, this is rows and rows and rows of just people just like stamping. And, and you're just like, holy shit. Like even I didn't realize it was like this big. And then when you start diving into the numbers and the, you know, the, the, the gross revenue of the Swiss, just the Swiss watch 
industry, you know, and then I, I'm a musician, right? So I come from running a ship with a hundred some odd people working for me for so many years. And obviously I know the business of music at its highest level, right? So I would equate like, what does the entire whole music industry make? And, you know, even if this is like, as record stores were dying and closing and people still actually made money in music. <laughs> yeah. And I would look at like the watch company's revenue and I just, just pick, just pick Rolex. Rolex is $10 billion annually. Ten, and that's what's on paper. Let's be yeah. real. Yeah. Right? That's crazy. Okay. 10. That's one company. Not even counting the gray market. Right. Right. So it, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's pretty mind boggling. So everybody should, should kind of know that. How, how big this is, what I do, it, it's pretty massive, but my love is for vintage. Right. That's what I've been doing since I was a kid before it was called vintage. So I'm kind of like the guy who grew up wrenching his, wrenching 63 vets and, and you know, Camaros, and, but they weren't vintage. They were just like, they were in need of repair. And now he got old and he's still, you know, he, he's still wrenching vets. And now they're calling vets 63 split windows, like, you know, vintage. Yep. It's the same. That's what I am for watchmaking. But I was privy to go to a more modern school and then learn perpetuals and uh, tourbillons and, and all that. So I have the mind and uh, the experience, bench experience of vintage. And most of those guys are dead now who taught me. And then I have the, the schooling of the more modern as well. So that's why I this Swiss view me as an American who's actually okay. <laughs> let me ask let me ask you a, a grand seiko question because you know when you're first getting into rolexes say myself in the 90s the first one i got was an explorer one 1016 and then i got into subs and you know when you first get it you're like it's the finest timepiece the accuracy is amazing and then later on you realize, oh, that's false. It's like plus five or minus five or, or, you know, and then you get into Grand Seiko, which is a Japanese high end, um, you know, high end in that, in that kind of uh, world, their accuracy is unbelievable. And why is that compared to say Rolex? I know Rolex is entry level into uh, watchmaking, but why, why is that? Um, you know, um, it's a balancing act between all components and, you know, um, back in the, back in the fifties or so, there was kind of, it's kind of like a race between the Germans, Swiss, uh, and, and then the Japanese of who can, who can somehow make these micro mechanics more accurate. And they, they hit a brick wall for many years, you know, that, 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 I mean, every year in Switzerland, there was, there was contests just like it's. Just like a contest in any other industry, like who, who could make something more accurate, but then it would also have to be profitable to make and would people really want to buy that, right? But so it was a race, like who could make something better? And we had, we had cost back then, which was, you know, it's pretty accurate, but again, we have to think about the time period that they were in back then and the, um, the electronics that were available. So the timers we had back then to time your watch were these like ticker print, they call Vibograph, it was the main company that made it, which was made by Griner. Um, and that's all you got. You didn't even get amplitude of the balance wheel. We didn't even know what that was. Even when I went to the Boulder School, there was no amplitude meter. Rolex was just getting the brand new Griner uh, amp addition to the ticker print uh, to, to check amplitude. So. Amplitude was checked in, in other in other realms. The average watchmaker didn't concern himself with amplitude even when he was overhauling and cleaning a timepiece. It was timing it that it wouldn't come back. Okay, even if it was cost. Uh, it, it's um, how can I explain this best? Uh, the timing machines we have now, like I have over here, there this is deep diving in. I could see inside your escape if you got enough money to get one. I could see inside your escapement and I could tell you if it's dirty before I even opened up the back of your watch. Wow. So I can tell a lot, a lot of stuff from these. It's not the little timers you guys are buying for $200 on Alibaba. All right. Yeah. Uh, and timing in seconds per day means nothing. I, I know everyone is hooked on that crap now. They check it and they, you know, that means absolutely nothing. 
there's so much mechanics and everything going on um, that all of you guys at a collective have bypassed the main heart of the timepiece, which is the hairspring. That's what you all should be talking about. Because we spend six months to a year of our human existence every single day in the proper watchmaking school. And when I say proper watchmaking school, watchmaking schools in Europe are, are start at four years. I mean, you, usually they go to 10 years and you still don't know shit. So it's way past doctors and lawyers and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we just spend that much time on hairsprings because we can actually, I can tweak hairsprings for hours and hours and fix that timing that, you know, no, no one else is going to, you know, be able wow. to. Wow. So it gets really, really deep, bro. So anyway, that the race that you're talking about uh, with the Japanese, they, they said, okay, we already got cost. Like, let's, let's, let's convince the Swiss. Like we got, they let's battle them. War, it's fucking war, bro. You know, like, yeah, yeah. like you know, it's like Iron Maiden is, is playing, and we're the opening band, and we got to try to blow them off the stage. Which is what Iron Maiden is the only band in the world that would allow us, Metallica, or any of us, to do that. Every other band limits your sound. I don't know if anybody knows this. Opening bands don't get the full power of the sound system. They don't get all the lights. They don't right. get the lights pointed at them. The lights are focused for the headlining band. So even if the, uh, the headlining band sucks and they're shit, they they can't play three chords. When they come on, it's like woo. Oh, they're so fucking great. Uh, the opening band was okay. Maybe I'll buy their album. You know, and maybe they'll come around next year and they'll be a little, bit, a little bit better. They'll learn how to play. So, you know, it's the same kind of thing. They wanted to have that. Well, well, anyway, so Iron I just Iron Maiden wouldn't do that. They're the only band that's the coolest fucking people ever. They taught us all how to tour. Okay, right. So we're like, have at it, bro. Blow up the sound system. I don't give a shit. Go ahead and try to blow us off the stage. And that's that's how we learn from from the greatest you know but anyway they wanted that that war kind of thing going you know the japanese and the swiss weren't going for it so they developed their own testing system that was would be certified above cost and they were headed to develop their their original grand seiko movements uh to get there and they did and it's some of the 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 greatest movements ever made and and people are just finding them now uh but from a watchmaking perspective, you know, if you already got your Rolex uh, and you know a decent watchmaker who knows Grand Seiko movements, th there's no parts for them anymore. Uh, so we have to make whatever's missing or, or you got to buy two or three and, you know, grab the parts you need. Unbelievable movements. Unfucking believable bro. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Even the new ones, you think the new ones are any good? The new ones are really good, yeah. yeah. I'm talking about the vintage stuff. Right, right, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But let's talk a little bit about the, the new, yeah, yeah. No. But, thumbs up to any of the new mechanicals uh, that they're producing. Is, I mean, if, if you if you don't have to have the Swiss or German stamp, man, like you, you got best best way to spend your money, your hard earned money. You got between three and five grand. You got the equivalent of a fifteen thousand dollar watch with the other stamp on it. Yeah, I know. It's it's crazy. And uh Grand Seiko, their dials are unbelievable. unbelievable. And yet still people are just like they don't even know it. They're, you know, because it's all about bling and you know it, it's that kind of uh flex mentality of you know that fucking hand on the steering wheel of a Ferrari, like yeah, with their fucking watch or whatever. And um it's interesting because you could, you know, I, I like the vintage tutors, you know, they're mind boggling to me, the snowflakes and all those old ones, you know? Yeah. So it is a, it is an interesting animal. And also when you think about this watch world, I just know 10 years ago, nobody wanted an Aquanaut. I mean, people were trying to give them away, you know, oh, that thing's ugly or whatever. And you could get a, a 15 year old Aquanaut back then for like nine grand, you know, right. like, and now, you know, there's 65 grand to 70. Uh, so it's funny well, how the world's changed. Um, I had a collector today, the other day, he's looking at a paddock, um, a chrono pre-owned. And I, I do um, um, antiquarium historical checkouts before people buy it to make sure they're legit and, how many other horrible watchmakers have been inside fucking hacking away to know, you know, if, is it worth it? You know, the kind of thing. 
And it's a newer timepiece, right? It's before they went in-house. But the timepiece has a, a, an old Lamagna in it. Right. So that's way, you, it's like you're, you're getting a new watch that is vintage. Right. And there'll be parts for that or we can make them uh, or I can make them uh, for forever. They're, they're nice, big, thick. You know, it's one of the greatest chronographs ever made. It's, it's the same caliber, 320, you relabel 321 in the Omega Moon Watch and all that. It's the same caliber, just built, everything is built, uh, what we call an, uh, e, their Ebosh. So Ebosh means uh, if it's a car engine, right? You, you could have a Ford Mustang and you could drive off the lot for, you know, the, the cheapest model. And then, you, you know, you could have a GT350 basically same engine but like all the metal they use is better you know everything is just jacked right it's the same thing in watchmaking and that's what the ebosh is there'll be a person a company that makes the movements uh this movement was developed in the late 20s uh but it's still made today um and uh they'll sell the cheap version to this company to Bruin or Bolivar or someone right right you gotta collect this be careful when you see Oh, it's a Valju 72. There's all different kinds of Valju 72s, bro. Right? There's the unadjusted Valju 72, which means it's the lowest quality. It's not just the finishing when you guys look in there. When I rip them apart and I got to time them, everything is different. The metallurgies that we use for the wheels, everything is different. It's not just spit and shine and it's got two more jewels. It's completely different levels, just like car engines, of that EMOSH. So if you go into the paddock, they'll actually go to the supplier and say, not only do we want the highest level, but we want the wheels made out of this. We want this type of steel. It's not just the, 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 the polishing, you know, it's not just, oh, it's got a swan's neck regulator. You know, that doesn't mean shit. <laughs> yeah. And also all those old watches, kind of like what you're talking about with cost and why the cool you time them great all the old watches that i get now that weren't even cost back then if i really want to I, most of the good quality movements i can bring past cox wow really because of the timing machines wow and, and the abilities that we have now so we can really treat but is the time worth it uh, my bench time is your is your wallet yeah. Was, is it really worth it? Because, you know, gravitational pull is going to affect any timepiece you have. You, you know, tourbillons don't negate for gravitational pull. It's, it's, it, everyone's got a tourbillon now. It's not what it used to be. Right. Um, it doesn't really help. We already have gay over coils, even the flat hair springs that are free sprung now, like a Rolex. Free sprung mean there's no regulating pins. The hair spring doesn't have to go through those pins and then keep bouncing off it. Um, negating those you're is you're past what an old tour beyond that Breguet was making uh and he thought that was you know exceptionally amazing uh it's way past that already so how many how much more accurate accuracy uh do you want as long as you can get past the regulated pins that's what uh fucks with timing a lot does it also have to do with um how how wound your watch is. So if it starts to unwind, it starts to slow down or speed up, which is it? Yeah. yeah. They go to the main screen. All right. So. That's a Rolex 1520 mainspring. Wow. Yeah. So, so this gets wound up. If you can see it. Okay. It's pretty yep. thick, right? Because wait, the Rolex. The, that's a Rolex from the mid sixties, right? The fifteen hundred yeah. series. It's almost the size of like a pocket watch. Like smaller, but I mean, look, look at it. Look how thick that shit. This is just the main plate, everybody. There's no gears. There's nothing on it. Only the setting mechanism. I'm rebuilding this one completely. Wow. There's been like 20 hacks inside here. So this <laughs> spring, this spring, you have to wind this thing up, right? Jum, 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 until and it fits inside the barrel with all kinds of greases and lubrications and synthetic greases. 
And when when it, when your when when your Rolex winds by your wrist, this is an automatic watch, right? When you move kinetically, right, you mean, it actually winds your wrist. At the tip of this mainspring here, this is cool stuff because not, not many people get to see this stuff. Uh, let's see. All right, that's the end of the mainspring. Yeah. You see that theme? You can see it, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's got like two pieces. It branches off like a Y. Yep. All right. When you wind it in, in the back, it, it actually goes together like that. So the inner force is the outer against the bow wall. So when you move your wrist, and as long as you wear your, your automatic watch every day and you don't take it off, you're at full wind. It gets to full wind. And you know those old wind-up watches where you would get to the end and it just stops? Yeah, yeah. And when my generation, your dad said, don't, don't push it past that. You're going to break the fucking mainspring. Yeah. I'm about to go bring it and get it fixed. Because at the end of those, they have a little hook and it was hooked into the barrel. So if you went too far, you just, you snap the sucker. Now you don't have that. This, it, it gets to the end and, and it's, it's a full tension. And then it will, it, the barrel is designed where it'll slip to the next, like a little, and then slip and then slip. So all day long, you're at full, which means your battery, if it's a battery, Let's let's compare it to a battery that's pushing something. Full juice. You just bought the battery. Battery's brand new. Yeah. If you don't wind your watch at all and don't wear it, yesterday was a Monday, today's a Tuesday. You forgot to put it on your wrist. You went to work. You came home. Now it's not wound up as much. It doesn't have as much tension. It's all wound up inside that barrel, pushing against that barrel. Because as it pushes the barrel, the barrel has teeth, and that teeth uh, uh, it's pushing all the other gears in succession. So you're not pushing it. all the other gears with the same force. So now everything starts to slow down and if it, and now your balance is, say your balance wheel was, was doing 305 degrees back and forth all day. That wheel is always going back and forth, everybody, right? With the hairspring in it. Ding, yep. ding, ding. As this dies and you, because you forgot to wind it, now it's not 305. Now it's 260. It's, it's only going 260. So it can't keep proper time because you're wearing it. You're going to bang your, bang your wrist on the table or whatnot. It's not going to absorb that shock as well as it would if everything is just like kicking at full bore. Wow. So you're a fan of winders then, huh? <sighs> I, go, I go either way. It right. depends upon whose winding system it is. Right, right. Most watchmakers, you know, we, we don't like winders because it makes the watch thicker and it's unnecessary parts. And we also love when you get used to a, a hand wind watch, you really start to become, it's, it's even more of your friend. Oh yeah. You wake up first thing in the morning and you're like, it's like, you're, you're, it's like you're stroking your cat, you know, it's like, oh, this is fucking awesome, bro. Yeah. And you can also feel when you're in need of a service, you, you mech, you're, you'll feel the mainspring and the greases. It'll be harder to wind after four or five years. You'll say, oh, shit, something's oh, out wow. of <laughs> What about the new reissue 321? Are you a fan of that movement on the uh, vintage uh, reissue? Yeah, uh, it's another good, if you got the money, I mean, the price is a little jacked for what it is. It is, yeah, it's 15, it is. which is kind of, it's up there with the Chrono, you know, the uh, Daytona. I, I can only say that because if, if you can find a 321, I, I can restore it and I don't get a bill for myself, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, yeah. But, but yeah, if you want a 321, you know, if you want a brand new vintage watch, you're looking at it. Yeah. 15 well spent. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Let me ask you out of the... And, uh, and that's the Lemania we talked about earlier. Because yeah. so, so if you want that watch, if you think that's a lot of money because everything is jacked, right? Um, if you want that watch and you don't want the paddock stuff, uh, that Lemania is in plenty of other watches. You can find them around. Just do your research. Even in sub brands that are no, no name brands. That's what's cool about Vintage. You could find... There were so many brands in the old days stuff and movements in there. If you're not into having to have a name on your, on your, on your skin, there's plenty of ways to get that same 321 and something else. Wow. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Just, just send it here. I'll take care of it for you. <laughs> what do you think about right now? If you were going to advise somebody other than an indie watch, AP Vacheron 
or Paddock? What What are your thoughts? Which one would you get? On the new watches? Yeah. Oh, uh, they're all wonderful brands. Okay. Yeah. They're big brands, and it comes down to exactly what you were saying, bro, about style. Yep. That's where it really comes down to with the with the newer, you know, big brand type of stuff. It's what mood are you in at that portion of your life? Because a timepiece marks a time period in your life. That's what's so cool about them. Um, people who are not into it might not understand it, but they can equate if they, if they start to hear someone like yourself or me talk about, because we went so deep down into the rabbit hole and I went, I went past the rabbit hole. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you are, are, you right? are the rabbit hole. I am the fucking rabbit hole. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not good either because I, t- I tell the collect, you know, the collectors visit me and they're like, never seen nothing like this in America. And then they just, they end up buying more than they, they, they should have. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, that's, it really is about style. But if you want, want to learn more, please read more about what's inside your watch. Because really, that's what you're paying for, for mechanical watches. What I just showed you, you know, the, the Rolex movement. If, if that Rolex movement is completely rusted and done and you got salt water in it, like I had one in here. Oh, uh, I saw that on I, Instagram. I want yeah. to tell everybody to look at the Instagram because he shows you. Uh, give him your Instagram real quick. Delray Beach Vintage Watches. Uh, well, little underscores in between. Or you could just go on my web, the website under the same name, DelrayVintageWatches.com. It'll take you to the Instagram. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I, it's awesome to see that. Like there's that Japanese guy. Uh, he's on Instagram and someone will have a, uh, like a, a fucking mill gas that was in the mud for two years. And then yeah. you watch him put that, uh, uh, take it apart. And then it just becomes this beautiful piece again. I was following you on Instagram, watching that going is, I just love that stuff to see. I mean, the amount of patience. And also I think about your hands from years of playing thrash metal, just you know, and, and palm muting and all that and, and down picking. And, you know, now you've got this loop in your eye and, and your, your hand. And I mean, I would go crazy because I'm just like, it's so small, everything. It's, it's I'm, I'm, I guess for what I did previously, I'm one of the few who can correlate, the, you know, the two things together. Uh, and obviously I was a lead guitar player. So lead guitar players, all of us have serious OCD problems. Most musicians, are, we have some of the worst cases of OCD known to mankind. Because yeah. if we didn't, we, we would have quit early on. Of course. Because if you take a lesson in whatever instrument you have, you have to lock yourself in a room and repetitively do the same fucking eight notes over and over again until the eight notes are perfect, and then move on to 16 notes, and then move on to 24 notes. And you do that your whole life, right? You're, you're never good enough. Uh, yeah. golfers golfers can equate you always suck <laughs> you have a good day but you're human right and uh, whatever i did that day like uh if you play played a live show had a great show you fucking scored man you just crushed it that night you're like okay woke up that morning i had a hershey bar at 802 i had a fucking bowl of cereal with two bananas you know, you do the same thing the next night, and you, you fucking fall off the you fall off the stage into the audience. <laughs> you know, it's like comedy, man. It's the yeah. same with comedy. You're like, I killed last night with the same fucking material. What happened? Exactly. So they, that that kind of stuff equates into what I do because in watchmaking, uh, especially on your way up, uh, being taught by the masters in school, it you know back to your bench, kid. You know, you, you think like you you have you got the hairspring completely flat and you made your brigade overcoil or whatnot, and you're like, fuck man, I can't wait. It's just like guitar, right? I can't wait to show the teacher, you know? And you, you know, you bring it to the front and he's like, Can you see? Like, dude, it's fucking so fucked up, bro. Back to your bench. And you're like, Well, what did I do wrong? Figure it out for yourself. Yeah. Because you know what? You're gonna be alone in your workshop later on, not work advice on some brand when you get older, and there ain't no answer. It's you, some teacher told me it was, it's you and the watch. Like, that's it, bro. Like, you got to figure it out if you want your cash, you know, or yeah. if you just want to beat the problem. So that, that those two things, are, they definitely correlate that heavy OCD thing. What's in your collection? Do you have a collection or did you sell them to start the business? What's going on there? 
Uh, I was never big on collections. You know, my grandfather obviously had a you know, massive collection. My father had a massive collection from his dad. My father was not a watchmaker. He's an attorney. Uh, so it was my grandfather and his father. That's who the third generation comes in. Um, so I did have a lot of paddocks and stuff like that myself. But as you can see, I, I don't wear a watch. Um, it, a lot of us don't. And you could, all you guys probably wonder why. It's Well, we keep changing stuff like, like you guys were. I yeah. have my eyes set on something right now. Uh, what is it? I wanted, wanted, wanted for for a while. Uh, what is it? Something called the Poly Plan by Movado. So it's oh, a Movado. First, an old Movado. Uh, to me, it's, it's a time only, but it's one of, if not the most complicated wristwatches ever tried to be produced. There's not many of them out there. So it's instead of the main plate, like you saw before, being on one plane. They, they wanted to make it uh, in the shape to fit your wrist. Uh, you've seen watches like that previously where the case is kind of bent. Yeah. But when the cases are bent in those watches, they just have a movement like in the center where it's flat and there's nothing, there's, there's no movement when you open up the back on the part that wraps around your wrist. Well, this, they actually have the mechanics going like the main plate goes like that. So the balance wheel is here at an angle at a 30 degree or 20, 28 degree angle. And then your setting me mechanism is over here at angles. And then the wheel train is up here. And then somehow it all has to like interconnect. So the gears are all beveled and it's just insanity. Let me ask you, um, you know, one of my uh, close, close friends is Bo Gore at Los Angeles Watchworks. And he is one of the greatest um you know, watch people that I know case restoration alone is so mind boggling from people that have over polished these amazing 5402s or these Nautiluses, you know, just destroying cases at Ben bridge. We'll make it look new, <laughs> but, um, you also, um, uh, provide a service now of restoration and, um, and, you know, refurbishing movements and everything and, and also making your own uh, watch brand still. Are you still doing that? The Spitz watch? Yeah, I, I've done a few watches under NDA and then I've been developing uh, my timepiece for about five or six years now. Um, and it's a single impulse escapement timepiece where the entire escapement and all its parts, including the escape rail, are made from titanium. So that's never been, none of that's ever been done before. And um, uh, a single impulse escapement was, is more accurate than the lever escapement, which is in pretty much every watch that is known to mankind because it's, it's uh, inexpensive to produce. It doesn't have many parts to lever escapement. But the lever escapement is inherent, has inherent flaws in it, which uh, is the reason all you guys have, have probably heard about George Daniels' escapement. Uh, that's in all the Omegas. He tried to at least convince the Swiss, you know, they're, they're please like I could, I've developed something that doesn't have much more parts. So it would be really nice if you implemented this because it, 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 it's, it's, it's the next level. And that took him almost his whole lifetime to convince, you know, the Swiss to buy something from a, from a British guy. You know, think about that, that, that yeah. in all their watchmaking, Ateliers everywhere through Switzerland and all their geniuses and tradition uh, that's handed down, they actually caved and bought something from a British dude. Wow. And British watchmaking has been around a long time. We, we all know. But so is American. You know, we led the world when we were developing pocket watches. We were above, we were you know, way ahead of everybody else. So my my escapement is, uh, is above that. Um, it's a marine chronometer escapement. Uh, so way back when, when ships needed to be totally accurate and not so they didn't crash into continents <laughs> and yeah. kill everybody, yeah. it, you know, in the marine chronometer uh, is an escapement where it's called a single impulse escapement. It needs no oil. Um, it has no draw like a lever escapement. Lever escapement, when it hits the pallet, there's, there's two like movies on a pallet. And as it pushes your, your uh, um, balance wheel back and forth, it doesn't just push it, it actually gets sucked in and draws in. So we have to lubricate the tips of those jewels. So every four or five years, they get kind of gummed up and shitty from just going back and forth. And that's where your, your, that's where your timing 
uh, idiosyncrasies come from that you were speaking about earlier. And like, Dan, why can't we just make a more accurate watch? Why can't it be like B line, like zero, zero, not plus two, minus two, or, you know, minus four, plus six cost or whatever it might be. Uh, the lever escapement is, is the culprit of all of that. Wow. It has to be oiled in, and it's just going to get dirty, even though it's sealed in there. So and a single impulse escapement doesn't have that. And none of those inherent qualities. It runs on no oil. Mine's all made out of, you know, complete titanium. And on top of that, the world's largest balance wheel that's made out of also titanium. That's it's, that's it is a trip. That's cool, man. How about this? When you're working in the workshop, do you listen to music? <laughs> Everybody asks that. Do they? Um, uh, I listen to to old jazz. Yeah, yeah. It, because I'm working on stuff that's quite expensive and most of it is irreplaceable. I do yeah. a lot of antiquarian work for, for museums, and Phillips. Uh, like I, I, I'm a, one of only two watchmakers ever allowed in the most expensive and rarest Rolex in the world, the Zero Graph. There's only one in the whole world of this, it's a prototype. So what I work on, I, I can't fuck up. <laughs> so, I'm not gonna, gonna put Slayer on, you know, I'll be like, <laughs> Yeah, but the funny part of that is, is when, after I graduated school in Switzerland, I'm, I was the first American let into what's called complication rooms in Switzerland in big brands. So there's the regular watchmaking rooms where they're build, either building new watches or after sale service when you send your watch in. If it's a perpetual calendar or uh, say for, uh, work, uh, I headed up uh, Chopard uh, for their watchmakers and. And for, for a couple of continents. If I have to train them, I'm training them in a room and there's, there's lots of watchmakers, not one or two guys like, like in this country. It's like rooms of watchmakers. And then there's the little room for the crazy ass dudes. Yeah. There's like some companies have two, some company have five and you learn by repetition. Same thing. Each, if it's perpetual calendar, then that guy gets a job and he's handed on day one a perpetual calendar there's no manuals for this stuff. Someone helps him, you know, or there is the guy died and he finally got his job. He has to figure it out for himself. And that's all he does is that one very, very complicated calendar. That's his job. So you get faster at it, faster at it, right? And you know all the idiosyncrasies of, of, of what's wrong with that caliber. So in those rooms, the, I was the first American at that time that they let in to those. It's like a secret fucking society of woman haters club, you know? Like uh, like little rascals, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. what I, that's what I kept thinking. Like there'd be a sign on there, like Secret Society of Woman Haters Club, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know that episode from the Little Rascals, but it's really funny. So I, I think he man, he man's it. women haters club. He man woman haters club. Yeah, that's it. He man woman haters club. Yeah. It's <laughs> like I'm looking for that sign, you know. So uh, I go in there, but I, my first experience in one of those rooms, it was probably six watchmakers, old guy and one old guy. Um, looked like he was going to die, but he was like the master. And then there's these other guys and they got the, the headphones on or they got like buds were just coming out, you know? And I'm like walking around and I'm like, they knew who I was, you know? Yeah. They were, so I'm looking at them. I see the guy CDs and I see Slayer, Metallica. I see all just, you know, fucking, you know, thrash metal, and, you know, all kinds of just, I'm like, and I'm looking at him. I look at his bench and he's probably got like, maybe five, six million dollars of like parts of watches everywhere. You know, the craziest watches known to mankind, you know, like yeah. tourbillons with chronographs and gongs and shit, you know? And I'm like, this guy's blasting fucking Slayer. <laughs> like taking apart these, like, I'm like, holy shit, bro. And I like tap him on his phone. So he's like, yeah, dude, metal. And they're all metal heads. Yeah. Like, all these guys, they're all fucking metal heads. And they're like ripping apart these masterpieces. And I was like, I think I fit in here. Like, this is, this is cool. This is better than school. You know, like they're, they, they're kind of like me. They're an outcast. They're locked in a room. Their job is, is in Switzerland. You have your job for life. Like it used to be here. Right. You know, they can't fire you. Once yeah. you get hired, like you're, you're good, you know? So they, they don't worry about tomorrow. They don't have a job. They can really concentrate on, on their work and, and chill and do, do work a lot slower and more proficient. But just to see, and then I went to go to the next guy. It was the same thing. Like they're all just blasting metal. Some wow. Kind of metal, you know? Wow. So it, it was it was really an eye-opening experience, but I can't, it gets me, I don't know, 
Yeah. I think I want to pick up my guitar and just like destroy everything in here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me ask you, when you were working for as a ghost ghost uh, watchmaker and stuff, in, in this world, two questions really, in this world of uh, the quote unquote, uh, you know, um, lack of stainless steel pieces available now, were you able to, let's say you're doing uh, a, a ghost building for one of the big watch companies, could you go in there and go like, hey, uh, can I buy one of these such and suches, you know, that aren't available? Oh, I see where you're going with that. Um, <clears throat> no, actually, uh, um, if you work for a company, yeah, we, 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 we have privy to stuff like that and we, and we do get a, a discount, but that's only because I, I'm not, wasn't just like a, a watchmaker. I, I was the instructor and the teacher at most places. Right. Uh, so I, I was privy. You, you have to go on a list if it's a limited edition and that kind of stuff and, you know, and know the right people. But yeah, they do help us out somewhat. We, they know we're not there to resell it. That's why. Right, right, we, right. We have a passion that's even beyond the collector, way beyond the collector. You know, we're going to wear it. You know, we're going to just like worship that watch almost, you know, like, and we like it because of the mechanism. You know, if it's got a zenith in it, you know, I mean, we're all, if you're a chrono freak like me, you know, like, you're like, wow, you know, like, like, wow, I got to get me a zenith. Because when you, when you start out getting into somewhat complicated watches as a watchmaker and you get your first zenith, you know, or a Rolex version of it, that's the beat slowed down. You're just like, holy shit. Like, like, why isn't this like in every watch, you know, like yeah. why, why is it, why did this movement get a bad rap in the States? And you start like wanting to know all this inside information, you know, and then you find out again, it was to hack watchmakers out there um, running a high beat movement which is another reason the Grand Seiko's, the vintage old ones didn't, didn't get uh, traction is because we didn't have epilame back then. Epilame is a coating. Uh, yeah. It's an anti-oiling coating. So you can treat a part with epilame. Uh, say it's the, the, the pallet fork, which has the two jewels on it, right? Uh, and the escape wheel. Um, uh, a Zenith or a Grand Seiko runs at like 36,000, which is like twice what an old time pocket yeah, watch. like the hy hyper beats and stuff right so if you don't oil that with extreme precision before there was epilane the pallet's going so fast it, it's literally could be spitting oil you know inside and it gets messy and that stickiness i had talked about previously is not just your normal stickiness it's actually just kind of it's just it's bad watchmaking it's all over the place so when you're trained in switzerland of course you know how to do this but everyone was servicing the watches as fast as they can for as cheap as they can. It, the mindset of this country, you know, how cheap can I get my watch service instead of where's the best motherfucker there is? Of course. You know, it's like when you, when you wanted to learn how to play guitar, like where's the cheapest motherfucker in the town? I want to learn from him. No. No. No, where's the fucking Grand Poobah, right? I, yeah. I'll give up and pay an X triple. Yeah, where's Joe Satriani at, you know? <laughs> That's the mindset we have in this country and it's horrible. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they got they all got a bad rap and now we can coat those. That's what epilame is. It's kind of saving these horrible people who are self-proclaimed watchmakers with, with no traditional schooling. They can coat the parts and then if they oil the face of the jewel sloppy, it'll still hold that oil in the face of the jewel because you rub off the epilame on the face of the jewel but leave the sides of it coated. So when the oil starts to run on the sides from bad watchmaking, it won't let it. It'll just repel it. Oh, wow. It's like a repellent. So Zenith Daytona over the in-house one now, you're saying, right? Oh, yeah, bro. No shit. That's a good I'm thing old, to know. I'm old school. Absolutely. Good luck finding one, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, man, yeah. Ro Ro it, 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 that is one of the main reasons that the Zenith in the Rolex does not run at 36,000. It runs at 28.8. They slowed it down. Wow. Wow. And all parts wear out faster too because all the wheel, everything's turning faster. Uh, guitars, you still got your guitars? They all hang in the Hard Rock Cafe. 63 of my guitars uh, after the last 
to, when I decided to kind of semi-retire, um, I phoned them up and for safekeeping reasons, I, I gave them all my guitars. So they used to be hanging everywhere. My Everyone always asked, where's your turtles guitar, dude? Everyone always wants to know where that one was. Yeah. Uh, that last was seen in, in, in the hard rock in, in Japan. I wow. don't know. They, they store them. They keep them, they put away. Amps, you got any amps uh, anymore? No, it's all gone. Yeah. That's I lost my I good I lost my good amps in that in the fire. If you remember uh all our equipment burnt down. Yeah. Uh, a recording rehearsal place uh burnt down many, many years ago. And those were all my main that was my sound burnt that day. Wow. No, no people always I guess we can get a couple of things straight here. Everyone always is always asking did we lose did we lose all did my guitars burn in that fire? Because they haven't seen my guitar. No guitars were ever destroyed. Mine or Scott's or Frankie's in that fire. They were on the opposite side of, of where the fire was in the building. Thank, thank goodness. All stacked up. But we wow. lost all our amps, all our equipment, all, all everything in that fire. It was a horrible day. I remember the first time seeing you guys. Uh, River Theater, Guerneville, Among the Living. Or, sorry, oh, really? uh, Spreading the Disease. Sorry about that. Uh, yep, River Theater, and wow. uh, you're old as shit. Yeah, I, I go way, way back, <laughs> and you know, and then over the years, Scott Ian plays with me in my Bon Scott tribute. So uh, it's it's been great to be able to, uh, you know, all these years later, we're alive. Uh, we played metal. I do comedy now. You make watches, but we're still alive and. Uh, and rocking, man. And it's so great to talk to you about, you know, because if we were on the road together touring, I wouldn't even be talking metal with you at all. I'd be talking watches or cars or architecture, <laughs> mid-century design, you know, that's the bonding that creates long lasting friendships and hangs. I was telling somebody this a couple of days ago, I was able to work a long time in the biz because I was able to hang. And a lot of people don't know how important the hang is over anything else, you know? Yeah. It's, and, and, uh, I, I guess, you know, both of you and I come from, you know, obviously, you know, we're older. So we come from a generation that's free of what we were able to do right now. It's like see each other, like a video phone was like, yeah, right. Like that was in our comic books and shit, but we kind of knew that anything that was dreamt up by someone who actually uh, is just so creative um, that draws something in a comic book and comes up with that idea. This stuff blows my mind, by the way. And metalheads talk about this all the time. Yeah. Some dude, like in his dreams or as he was walking or on a subway, was thinking just like Jimi Hendrix, like, you know, like, I wonder if this that looked like this could do this. So a rocket that goes to the moon should look like this. And it was in a comic book, but just so happens when the scientists decide they want to go to the moon, they copy the dude from the comic book and yeah. the shit works. They didn't yeah. make the rocket look like a vagina. They made it look like a cock and it worked. How is that possible? Why wasn't it in a vagina rocket? Like everything in a comic book that comes to physical life, it works. I don't yeah. understand. Yeah. Jetpacks. How did a, a jetpack could have looked completely different, right? It could have yeah. been, it didn't have to look like the two things on your back and do could have been on your hands. Yeah, could have been on your hand, could have been whatever it was. That dude thought jetpack drew it in the comic book and it worked and it worked in cartoons. And all of a sudden, when they go to make a real jetpack, the shit works. How's that possible? <laughs> so, us metalheads are extremely creative people because we know most of those people that were doing comic books love the music that I helped to create and my friends. Right. And that we grew up with, you know, with anti disestablishment and not joining society. We have a different look on, uh, you know, being controlled and, and all that stuff that goes along with being in our tribe. And it's a loving tribe. And that's the stuff that that most people outside of our tribe, they never understood, especially before the Internet. Is Satan's music. Stay away. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. Meanwhile, we're the most loving people that the fucking is. We're the outcasts. We're very creative. And when we get together, we're an incredible force of love. Oh, and, God, yeah. You know, and we always want to help each other. Um, so it's a complete opposite of what people think it is. Once again, and usually we're the most broken people there are. We are the outcasts. 
And I think that's where all, all our creativity comes. That's what I do here. I know people just like, how do you go from music to what the fucking with cuckoo clocks? <laughs> you know, yeah. or whatever he's making. Oh, now, now they know, you know, I work on. Yeah. Music, right? Two um, questions before we get out. One, what's the greatest metal album in your ears? Oh, God. Probably the Who Quadrophenia. It's not metal. Yeah, yeah, I get it. But well, that's a that's a fucking yeah, great that, record. Yeah, it's, I, I I wore that out so many times. Yeah. yeah. And second question: Are you a comedy fan? And if so, who's your comedians? Uh, besides yourself, uh, <laughs> no, yeah, I'm a comedy go. fan, and it's pretty vast actually. So yeah. I rather name names because I enjoy a lot of people. I get it. I get yeah. it. Just I mean, throw it on. And most laugh. of the stuff I watch on TV is, is 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 comedy. I like to keep laughing. And after working, you know, locked up under glass here, uh, on some of the most intricate shit in the world, you, you need to release, you know. So that's just what's better than laughing. Nothing. All right, everybody, hit up Dan. Uh, give him your website one more time. Delray Beach Vintage Watches dot com or Instagram is the same name. And if you need any kind of watch service or anything, or if you want to, uh, you know, have them build you a watch, which are, what would that cost? Like, what is one of your timepieces? They, they sold out in minutes. Wow. Yeah. Well, how many were there? Uh, rather not say. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. They're, All right. Uh, yeah. Well, but there, might be, there might be another one down the pipeline later on. But my new facility is is mainly uh, anything that's older than 20 years that's great i i can't thank you enough for finally doing the show it's great to have you and like i always say you know say things come <clears throat> at the right time and i felt like this was the the best time to talk to you you know i i, I totally enjoyed myself so anytime you want to chat or do a maybe a couple of other collectors want to come on and do like a a, a, get a round table yeah yeah, we, we do the round table once a year after uh, Watches and Wonder, so it'd be great to have you on. Oh, sure. That'd sure. be fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much for doing the show, and I really appreciate it. And when I'm in uh, Florida area, I'll hit you up, and you can come to a show. Yeah, well, you come here. Oh, I'll, I would do, I'll, I'll do that uh, in a minute. You, you pull this stuff out here and blow your fucking mind, bro. I can't wait to see that. I will be yeah, there. Yeah, come on. Come I'll on be in. there in a minute. Yeah. And, uh, I'm wearing my my Tornik Revell nine hundred dollar. This thing is fantastic. This yeah, is yeah. A, a great fucking watch, man. Well, once you start deep, if you start really deep diving in vintage, man, just 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 hit me up. I'll hook you up. You got it, man. Thank you so much.